believe we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination, except we have been called by his name. We're going to be blessed today by the man of God. Would you put your hand together and welcome the bishop this morning? We love him and appreciate him. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Carney. Thank you so much. And as I say every time I come, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to Columbia and be with the Carney clan. I love these people sincerely. I love them like a family and how blessed you are to have uh, this tremendous uh, uh, leadership. Uh, Brother Donnie, would you come? I uh, traveling assistant, and I want to talk to you just about five to ten seconds about uh, some books and products that we have so that we can go home with you via our uh, material. Now, I don't know how many of you have already told that I got to ratchet up this morning. If I even come close to what was done here in the Sunday school hour by my wife, I am fully accustomed to playing second fiddle. I mean, I do that all the time, so I'm not in competition with her. I gave up a long time ago, but I am so glad that she was here to, uh, to bless you. We have some books uh, in uh, the front. Uh, Sister Tenney's book, Prayer Takes Wings, has been out of print for years. This will help you in engaging angels in your prayer life, especially during this time of fasting. Anybody ever need any help praying? This shows you how to bring angels in. Uh, Sister Tenney's uh, book on, God, can you hear me now? It's a book on prayer. And it's not like cellular one. You don't ever lose connection if you hold on. Uh, keeping balance in life, and we need that. Uh, some things I wish I could forget. Did you ever have some things you wish you could forget? That book may help you. Water from an old well and many CDs, DVDs there in the back. God bless you. Now it's time to get into the Word of the Lord. Your pastor has told you that this uh, has been dedicated this week as a week of uh, consecration. And may God to help it to, to be that. Uh, we're, we're living uh, in a day of consumer religion. People respond to what meets their needs. And you know, well, I want to be blessed, and I, I understand that. But oftentimes they don't respond to the challenge to reset priorities. And I hope that this weekend we can be challenged, not just the Lord meet our needs, but help us to reset our, our priorities. And teaching younger preachers, I often tell them there's two words that you must never forget, and that's priorities and discipline. Now anybody can set priorities, anybody. With just a little verbiage and thinking, you can set priorities. But then you've got to discipline yourself to do what your priorities demand. So may the Holy Spirit open us up this morning. And tonight I have a, a special message from the Lord for this church. And I trust you'll come back and hear what the Lord uh, has to say. If you have your Bibles, and uh, we'll turn with us to Hosea uh, chapter 10 and verse 12. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for the, it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign righteousness. And then to the book of Micah, chapter 2, and the verses 12 and 13. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee, I will surely gather 
the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah, as the flock in the midst of their fold. Now notice he's talking to the assembly and uh, he said to them in verse 13, the breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and gone and the king shall pass through the gate. Just, just give me a few minutes to elaborate on some things. Uh, the Amplified Version says of that passage, the breaker, the Messiah, will come and there will be a, a breaking through or a breaking out. The Messiah's Spirit's going to come and there will be a breaking out and a gate will be provided for the king to go through. Now, one more passage in 2 Samuel 23, 15, and 16. David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew the water. There are three things, uh, three things I want you to notice here today. In Hosea, he said it's time to break up the fallow ground. That's individually, personally. In Micah, he said the assembly, the congregation, must have a break out. And then lastly, he speaks of the men of God breaking through the lines of the enemy. I want to speak to you this morning about the law of the breaker. The law of the breaker. The breaking up, the breaking out, and the breaking through to a new dimension that God has for us and for the destiny of this church. Would you lift your hands and pray God's blessings on his word? Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I take dominion over any spirit that would come against what you're wanting to do here today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. The law of the breaker. Hosea said, break up the fallow ground. That's ground that had once been irrigated and ground that had once been fruitful and ground that had once grown crops, but it had lain dormant and unattended and not been broken and you'll never get a harvest. You said you'll never get rain until there is this breaking up of the fallow ground. And then he said, I'll rain righteousness. Now, there's a difference in heavenly rain and earthly rain. Uh, Rain comes to earth regardless of the condition of the soil. Whether you need it or not, when the heavens are ready, it's going to come. But heavenly rain is predicated on what earth does. If you break up the fallow ground, you get broken up on earth, and then heaven gets broken up and falls in a spiritual sense as a holy rain upon you. But it begins when individually we sense the need for returning to that fallow ground, to places where we were once fruitful and prayerful and fasted and worshipful and loving and soul winning. It's got to be broken up. And secondly, he said, in Micah, there's got to come this breaking out. If you want the king to come in, the whole assembly, it moves from an individual breakup to a corporate breakout. That I want something fresh to break out in the assembly of my people. And he said, if you do that, then in that assembly, a gate will be open 
and the king will come through. Now here's what God's saying to this church today. If you want to reach the apex of what God has for you in this year, individually we've got to return to our consecrations to God and break up the fallow ground. And then as we break it up, we come together corporately as an assembly. And in that assembly, because of a personal breakup, there's a breakout. And then comes the breakthrough. Breakthrough has to do with the enemy lines. And David's men in passion, driven because of their love for the king, driven because of their personal dedication to him, the Bible said they broke through the Philistine lines and drew fresh water from the country that the Philistines were then inhabiting. And if we're going to have the breakthrough that we need, there's going to have to be an individual breaking up a fallow ground. And then we bring our ground that's broken together corporately. And there is a breakout. Would you like to see a holy breakout here this morning? Would you like to see God show up? I'm not talking about a, a man show out. I'm talking about a God show up. Well, he said, break up the fallow ground. And it will attract my rain. And then the assembly will arise. As a breakout assembly. And then I'll lead you to the enemy territory. And you can have that breakthrough in the community. And people will come, come to Jesus. So oftentimes we say, Lord, tear me up. And then put me back together just like I was. But the Holy Spirit says, I want to rearrange the priorities and the pieces. I want you to become a church of destiny. This, I've, I've told you this every time I come. This is a church of destiny. And I hope before I'm through this morning, you can see exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. I, I can remember in times past the Olympics. What I think the Olympics began again uh, next year. And some of the, the records that men broke because they had this passion to break out of themselves and out of the box that had been set even by the previous generations. And they had breakthrough in the sports world. There was a man by the name of Pat O'Brien who won the gold medal in the Olympics back in the 40s. And uh, the gold medal for the shot put. And he threw the shot put uh, just a little over 16 feet. And they said, well, that can never be beat. Man will never reach the 17 mark with the shot put. He's done it. This is the best it'll ever be. Maybe if he practiced a little harder. But O'Brien went back and he practiced a little harder. And he, he wanted to excel what he had been doing. And he began to experiment with a different style. And I can remember back in the 40s was I was in school, they used to run like this and hop and whoop, over it went. They don't do that anymore. O'Brien decided in, that if he would whirl around and get momentum, he could throw it. And he threw it over 17 feet, and now most shot putters that are worth their salt can do that. But it was because he had a personal, I'm going to break out of myself. I'm not going to let these, these self-imposed self imagination and rules that it can't be done. I'm not even going to let the officials that say, you've done all you can do, stop me. I have a passion that is breaking up in me that I can go beyond. I'm not satisfied with the norm. I'm not satisfied how things work. I'm not even satisfied with what I did. I've got to prove that I can do more. And when I believe that I can do more, I'll bring to the sports world a desire to do more. And then there'll be a breakthrough. I hope that you can understand what I'm 
what I'm talking about. There are some churches that are memory driven instead of vision driven. And they're just accustomed to what things used to be. And now, he didn't change the shot put. He didn't change the rules. He didn't change the size of it. It was the same old-fashioned shot put. But it was his way of handling it and his passion to push and to do whatever was necessary to break out and take it to the next dimension. You remember the four-minute mile barrier? The expert said no one will ever be able to run the mile in less than four minutes. But in 1954, a young medical student named Roger Bannister did the impossible. He broke that barrier, and now every world-class runner on the circuit can run a mile in less than four minutes. But somebody had to get out there and get broken up and say, I'm not going to let uh, the record dictate to me. I'm going to go beyond the record. And I'm here to tell you, you've had great revivals in the past, but your greatest revivals are in your future. You're a record-breaking congregation. Break up. Break out. And then you'll have to break through. But you're crying, folks. You, you can imagine something can't be done so long as it can't be done. Remember the illustration of the fellow that put the fleas in the jar, put a lid on the jar, and the fleas jumped and jumped, and they kept hitting the lid? True scientific observation. They kept coming down. Well, he took the lid off the jar after several weeks. You know what? The fleas would jump to the top of the jar lid where it had been, not realizing that the lid had been taken off. Because you could, but they were dictated to by past experience. And they convinced themselves it can't be done. I've come to tell you it can be done. I've come to tell you there's a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this area. And for this congregation, it's the law of the breaker. The Bible is truth. But God in action is revelation. Now, just to preach the truth is not enough. We've got to have a revelation that the truth is active in our own lives, in the lives of this congregation, and in the lives of our world, and we're going to be a world-changing congregation. That's revelation. I don't want just truth. I want revelation. Hey, Woodlawn, are you ready for revelation? Are you ready to take the lid off of the top and see how high you can jump? There are God canners and there's can godders. I want to be a God canner. Instead of a can godder. Some people are always say, can God, can God, can God. Well, I'm here to tell you, God can, God can, God can, God can. I'm a God canner. Can I get a witness? Any God canners here? Anybody here that believes he's able to do exceeding, abundant, above all, we can ask a thing according to the power that works in you. <laughs> what a God. Every generation has got to have its break through. And we don't always hit it every time. I, I don't know whether I'm a success or not. But, Pastor, if I've ever been a success, I can tell you how I got there. I failed my way to success. I learned my greatest lessons, not from the things that went right, but the things that didn't go right. And backing up and trying something else. And seeing if God would, would honor that. All because one man. Yes, but you don't know. Don't ever let your present name your future. Don't ever let your past name your future. 
The glory of God was gone from Israel. A child was born. The woman called it Ichabod, which meant the glory has departed. She let a present bad circumstance name her future. God's gone from this place. God's not coming to this place. And every time they called Ichabod's name, it meant uh, the glory has departed. The truth of the matter is the glory was coming back. It wasn't long till they looked up from the fields at Obed-Edom and they saw the Philistine cart with the glory coming back. I'm not here to shout Ichabod. I'm here to shout Emmanuel that God is with us and the glory is in the place. I'm not going to let any past or present circumstance name the future. But if we're satisfied with the status of Whoa. If we're memory driven and we're not, you, you see, I talked about what they did in the Olympics in 1900. And I, I, I talked about what they did in the 1940s. There were things that happened in the 1900s when the Holy Spirit fell originally in the latter rain. Wonderful. I came in in the 40s. We had great revival. But and we've still got the same truth and the same rule book. But we're living in a different day. And we're, God is looking for some new gold setters that are willing to break up the fallow ground. And they're not just saved and sanctified and petrified, but they want to leave a new me. And when a bunch of new me's get together in an assembly, there is in that assembly a breakout. And when you get a breakout assembly, the king starts coming through the gate. And the first thing you know, there's a breakthrough of the enemy lines. And you're taking things that were behind the enemy lines and bringing them to the king as trophies of grace. That's what my God wants to do. It's the law of the breaker. When back in the 40s, again, when I was a little more athletic, uh, there was a man named Bob Richards, and he held the record for pole vaulting of 14 feet 11 and a half inches. And all of the officials and those that knew said, well, that's tremendous. That's the world's record. But no man will ever reach 15 feet because, and they, they figured it scientifically it can't be done. The inertia, uh, the pole, and uh, it, no, no man will ever be able to pole, uh, to pole that high. But an enterprising young athlete began to experiment with a fiberglass pole. And he soared over the impossible barrier and a young Polish athlete jumped 18 feet, 11 and a half inches. That's eight feet higher than Baxter did in the 1900 Olympics. He went eight feet higher. There is nothing that would please our elders, nothing that would please your old dad or old brother S.L. Wise, old, than to know that this generation had broken all the records and we went higher than they did in 1900 and higher than they did in 1940. Hallelujah. We're still obeying the same rules and we've still got the same equipment and that hasn't changed, but we've got a renewed zeal and passion. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. You know what that means? A passion to do your will has consumed me. So often, I've been in church, they'll say, I'll hear people say, I don't know what's wrong with my church. But they don't ever say, I don't know what's wrong with me. And when we get all the me's fixed, we get all the churches fixed. Years ago, I was arbitrating a little thing in a congregation when I was in Louisiana. And, and finally, one old brother got up and he said, Brother Tinley, look at all these empty pews. And of course, they were blaming the pastor. Ain't nobody coming. 
So I let him get way out on the limb. I said, you know what's wrong? These empty pews, I can tell you why. There's too many empty cars driving up to this church. If you'll fill up your cars before you get here with people, you'll have a full church. Isn't that deep? But you have to have a passion, passion, passion. And there was a, a, again, back a number of years ago, they used to jump six and six and a half feet, the high jump. That was the record in 1900. And they said, well, that's uh, seven feet might be about the best anybody could do. But a young man by the name of Fosbury came along, and he was a high jumper. And yeah, he could do the six feet, but he said, you know, I believe there's a better method. I believe we're letting the previous barrier intimidate us. And he developed what is now known as the Fosbury flop. He said, you guys, and, and I've been jumping, throwing our legs over first, but I think if you jump the bar backwards, head first, and the first thing you knew, he'd hit seven feet, eight and three quarter inches. Because he said, if I can get, you know what? He said, if I can get my heart over, my feet will follow. If we can get our heart over these barriers, and these self-imposed limitations, these imagined inferiorities, Somebody said, well, people just don't want this. Who told you that? Did the Bible tell you that? Did God tell you that? You're living in the most hungry. But Brother Tenney, look what all they're doing. You know why they're doing that? Because they're hungry for something, and they don't know what they're hungry for. And how can we feast in unconcerned abundance while so many don't have a crumb? I'm challenging you, Woodlawn. It's time to break up. This is a breakthrough church. I wish I could get a witness on that. This is a breakthrough church. You're going to break up the fallow ground. It's going to break out in the assembly. And you're going to break through. <laughs> Clap your hands to the Lord. say a word that lets the devil think he's winning. Yeah, we were doing all right, but the devil, quit bragging on the devil. He can stand a good ignoring. Well, what if he did do it? Well, if you speak of the fact that he did do it, you're bragging on him. And he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. And they that be with us are more. Should why should more honor less? Oh, the, the law of the breaker. Are you folks excited? I think we, some of you, I think we're going to have to put baking powder in your grave to get you to rise on the resurrection morning. Are you excited about what God's doing? Do you believe you can have the kind of revival I'm talking about? Do you believe you can have a breakup and a breakout and a breakthrough in this community? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You've got the best pastor that ever was. You've got a beautiful, a beautiful building. You've got the most powerful gospel known in the world. And you've got a hungry community. I'm prophesying 1912. Or rather 2012 is going to be... Oh, you know, the, the, the scripture in Matthew six nineteen. They said, "Lay up not up for yourself treasures on earth, where rust and moths and thieves break through." What? Breakthrough? Did you know the devil has a breakthrough? Thieves and moths. Lay not. 
How does the devil have a breakthrough? It has to do with treasures. Lay not up for yourself treasures. The preponderance of things, searching for things, seeking more earthly treasures, gives the greedy devil a breakthrough in your heart. And then that breakthrough in your heart can, in retrospect, end in a break out in the church. And the first thing you know, a break up, reverse order. Don't pick up the habits of this greedy, treasure-filled world and be completely controlled by your plastic and your bank account, what you have or don't have. Lay up for yourselves treasures. If you don't have more treasures in heaven than you've got on earth, you've given the devil a breakthrough in your life. If you're more concerned about things than you are God, then you've given him a break. And I didn't say things weren't important. But who gets the priorities? I'm telling you, you can either give God a breakthrough or you can give the devil a breakthrough. But Brother Taney, we don't have, we don't have. <clears throat> Did you know that the majority of the world lives on a dollar a day? That it's estimated that there's a billion people on the planet Earth that go to bed hungry every night. By the standard of the world, every one of us are wealthy. And God sees that. He sees Ethiopia and he sees Africa and he sees Asia and he sees us. And I don't want to get caught up with the system. If there is a God that rules America, it's the God of greed and the God of more. And we can be so hungry after more of the things of this life uh, until it stalls our appetite to have more of the things of God. I want more of his presence. Uh, I want more of his glory. I want more of the gifts of the Spirit. I want more of the fruit of the Spirit. I don't want anything to displace the King. I want to break through and bring trophies back. I'm telling you, this is a church of, of destiny. These men that I mentioned in the Olympics had to think outside the box. The scripture says in Matthew 11, 12, of the kingdom of God, the violent take it by force. NIV version says the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. We've got to get forceful to lay hold. We've got to get desperate, he said, become violent about the thing. I'm violent. I don't want to stay in, in 2012 like I was in 2011. I am violent uh, to break up my fallow ground. How can I preach to you if I can't break up my fallow ground and return to my basic faith and know that regardless of what's happening in my life, God is still in charge and he's in control and he loves me. I want to break up that thinking and get back to my raw faith that I had six Three years ago when I got saved and fell in love with Jesus. I don't want to lose my first love. And then I want to be a part of assemblies that want to make a gate for the king. We're going to have a breakup in this place. Hallelujah. We're going to bring our, our breakups to our breakout. And something's going to happen. And we're going to break through on our jobs and our communities. I'll come back next year and preach on one God in Acts 2.38. But the Holy Spirit said for me to tell you that he has a design for you to be a breakthrough church. Well, if God keeps his promises, we overlook a little scripture that uh, is found uh, in the book of Numbers where the Lord said something rather unique. Numbers 14, 34. He said, I'll breach my promise. What does breach mean? Break. He told Israel, if you'll do what I tell you to do, 
I'll stand by my word. But if you don't, I'm going to break my promise to you. And sometimes we've got this arid intellectualism that God promised, God promised, God. Most of God's promises are conditional. He told Israel, if you'll do this, okay. And th but he said, if you don't, I'll break my promise. God can give me a promise, but if I don't follow, he can breach his promise. He can give a congregation or a movement a promise, but if we don't follow in on the directions we've heard, he'll breach his promise. Before God in heaven, I promise you, if every member of this church will break up the fallow ground and you will bring that breakup spirit, this will become a breakout church. You'll break out in your jobs, your homes. You'll see loved ones come to God that you've given up on. And then you will have the breakthrough in this community. Well, Brother Tenney, we're always one, already one of the biggest churches. Quit laying on, back on your laurels. Uh, this is just the beginning of what God's going to do in Columbia. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you want to be a part of it? Or do you want to be a scorekeeper? And one that says, it can't be done. We've jumped as high as we can jump. The violent take it by force. God has the power to do what you have the power to ask. If you've got the faith and enough power to ask it, Take the limits off, God. I preached that last year when I, when I was here. You, you, you never record God as doing anything before he said it. Let there be light. He said it. Then it was. Let there be a moon. And he said it, and it was. Let there be, a, he said it, and it was. And uh, there's a scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.13. I believe, therefore have I spoken. If you believe something, you got to speak it. Against hope, Abraham believed. Did you know the Bible said that? He had to speak and believe against hope. hundred years old, and God said, you and Sarah are going to have a young one. And she's 90 and holding. He said, I don't have no hope. But he said, I'm going to believe against hope. I, I, my belief is going to go beyond my hope. You, I, you know, I hope, Brother Tenney, it'll happen. I hope, no, no, get out of that hope factor. And go to speaking. And I'm not talking about name it and claim it. God, it's going to happen. Hallelujah. It's going to happen. And we're going to transfer our, our vision. Genesis 46 and, and, and 4. The Lord told uh, Jacob that Joseph that Jacob was going to Egypt and that, Joker, that Joseph was going to close his eyes. What that meant is when you die, your son Joseph is going to come along and he's going to close your eyes and your vision is going to be transferred to him. And this vision is going to live for 400 years. And just as I said... You keep this vision alive. These people are coming out of here. Put your hands on your daddy's eyes, son. Someday, Brother Carney, your son's going to close your eyes. And your vision, which is in him, is going to be multiplied. And things that you won't see, except in the spirit, are going to be transferred to another generation. They're going to pick up your vision. There may be another man someday standing in that pulpit, but he's going to have your vision. Your vision, because it's going to be transferred with the closing of the eyes. And I, I, if Jesus tarries, somewhere down the road, somebody going to do the same to you, son. But this message and our passion for it must never die. The vision has got to be passed on. 
to your children and to your grandchildren. My great-grandchildren are sixth generation apostolic, not through me, but through their grandmothers, sixth generation. And every time I look at them, I pray the apostolic blessings on them. I called two of them this morning, and one of them was going off to school, and I reminded her that she's a covenant child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She's in a covenant relationship revealed through Jesus, and there's certain things that she's got to carry to the next level. There's higher goals. Oh, but Brother Tenney, you don't know what I'm putting up with and why do we get so negative? We're all putting up. If you can, if you can speak it, God can do it to this people. I have never heard one man in 62 years ministry say, my life was a wreck until I started drinking. And when I started drinking everything, uh, until I started taking that, smoking that marijuana and, 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 and taking those high, my life, I've never heard anybody say that. But I've heard people say, my life was a wreck until I met this man, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And he brought it all back together again. That's what churches are for, finding a hurt and healing it. But you got to have a breakup and a breakout and a breakthrough. Oh. Thank God for the words. Sister Tilly spoke about the presence. But I know this, my presence never changed anybody. But I can hold on, old Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel, he had to have a personal breakup. Held on for hours. And then finally, after he broke up the fallow ground, there was a breakup in the heavens. And there was a breakthrough of rain that came. But it started with one. What can one man do? You ever read about the church at Laodicea? It was lukewarm. They were still a church. That means they were doctrinally right because the Bible never called anything a church that wasn't doctrinally right. And they had people in the assembly, but they had the door closed. It's the only church that Jesus is on the outside of. He said, I stand at the door and knock, and if any what? Man. Did you know that one man in that church could have turned that church around? One man that got the vision, he could become a red-hot center fire, and we'd work the edges and pull them in. Well, I've got it, but everybody, all he needs is one man. What if he could get a dozen or a hundred or a thousand of men and women? How many doors could he open? Lukewarm churches. This church is designed to affect the world but vision without action is daydreaming and action without vision is a nightmare so God wants to give you a vision he wants to see you through Lord help us I am determined as best I can to have a break up the fallow ground in my own life. And I want to be a part of assemblies that break up and assemblies that break through and won't stop. My last scripture, Revelation 22 and 2. I want to put it up there. I want you to see it. In the midst of the streets of it and on either side of the river, there was a tree, a tree of life that bare 12 manners of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree was for the healing 
of the nations. God said one tree, and every month it appeared to have a different emphasis of fruit. And people ate the fruit, and the fruit was so powerful till the leaves healed the nation. It became one tree that affected nations because it was by a flowing river. You got 12 months to bear whatever fruit God wants you to bear in that particular month. And you got to stay in the flow. And I promise you that there's going to be healing leaves come. And that this church, before its history is written, will affect nations. Brother Tenney, this church in Columbia, Mississippi, do you know where all of this started? In one church in an upper room in Jerusalem with 120 members. Do you know where the latter rain started? In one church on Azusa Street, 40 by 60, that would seat about 150, crowd in 200 people. And every major Pentecostal denomination in the world traces its roots back to that one church that affected the whole world. <clears throat> now, is that what you want to be a part of? He that hath ears! Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's time to break up the fallow ground. There's coming a breakout in Woodlawn, and you're going to break through. And before it's over with, not only is this area going to be affected, but your leaves are going to heal many, and your waters are going to affect nations. If you believe it, stand and lift your hands to God and speak it out. I believe it, Lord. The law of the breaker. Break up. Break out. Break through. Everybody shout, break up. Shout it again, break up. Break out. Break through. Somebody shout, that's our church. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want to break up the fellow ground. Choose you a fruit for every month. Twelve months. Uh, I'm telling you, somebody's going to meet their destiny here this morning. Come on. I'm tired of just saying. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.